All right. Uh, let's. One of the things we didn't talk about about the uh, Prince uh, deal with Ian Kinsler is uh, Jerkson Profar. And I, you know, I saw this a lot on Twitter. I know a lot of you guys probably saw this on Twitter. Where man, folks just got so down on him. You know, he's playing third, short, second, even a little outfield, not playing every day. And people were ready to say, wow, the kid's a bust. Uh, this just doesn't work. And, uh, you know, I can't believe the Rangers are putting so much stock in this guy. And actually, I'm, I'm sorry, the way people would say that is, I can't believe the Rangers are putting stock in this guy. What about you, Mosley? That's how, I mean, that's how, that's how most of those guys would, would say that. But I'm just, I'm just curious, you know, uh, now that, you know, hey, the dust is settled, Kinsler's gone, there's a spot for Profar. What are your expectations for Jerks and Profar? Well, it's, I mean, obviously it's going to benefit him a lot that he's going to know every day where he's going to be. Uh, that's, you know, even if you're not a 20-year-old ball player, if you're 26, it cannot be easy to break into the big leagues playing three or four different positions and sometimes going six days without playing at all and being expected to contribute to a team that every night expects to win and expects to win every series. It's a lot of pressure. And this is a guy that's having to adjust to big league pitching at the same time that he's learning new positions basically defensively. I mean, there was even the, the, you know, the couple games where he got looked at in left field, which he had never even played in the minor leagues. And I think this year we ought to see a lot more production from him at the plate, not just because he's been through the league once, but because he's going to be at second base just about every night, and he doesn't need to worry so much about, you know, the different nuances of different positions. But it, because we're talking about what most people in baseball consider to be a franchise shortstop, is it taking away from his value to have him playing second base? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, Ian Kinsler was a minor league shortstop. Dustin Pedroia was a minor league shortstop. Sometimes because of need, your shortstop becomes a second baseman and turns into a great second baseman. Second base is becoming an offensive position. I mean, you've got to have a guy there that can hit the ball and produce runs. Obviously, they had one. They've got another one coming. I know a bunch of you have probably seen Rugnet Odor play once or twice. Tepid P probably has seen him 100 times because he watches him online every night <laughs> way too often. <coughs> um, but but Rugi Odor is going to be a big league second baseman for a lot of years. I. I'm kind of torn because I, I love his element of what he brings to a game, and I would love to see that here. I don't know where it fits because you would have – obviously you'd have to trade Profar or trade Elvis and move Profar over, which I don't think is out of the question. You know, I think the Rangers are really open to anything if it's the right move, and, and they do have a second baseman coming that's pretty special. Yeah, and, uh, you know, to that end, <clears throat> this is a uh, front office that is as tight-lipped as any I've ever even heard of in sports. When it comes down to the winter meetings – you, you can't get a peep out of them. I mean, you just can't. It's not, it's not how they roll. Yet, they show up at the winter meetings, and then one of the big national scribes says, the Rangers showed up, and they're shopping Elvis, and they're ready to go with uh, Rugi. At, you know, and Rugi and Profar are going to do it together, and that's how they're going to roll, and they're going to trade Elvis. So when you started hearing those rumors at the beginning of the winter meetings, what did you think? Are you saying that they operate differently from the Cowboys GM who has a circle of reporters around him after every game? <laughs> <laughs> I love that they are stealth bombers. I, I, I don't. I, I, I hate it. I know it's it's bad for business for you, but um, you know I think you know the the fact that sometimes they end up signing a player that no one knew they were in on, and other times everybody's convinced that they you know that that Zach Greinke is just destined for Texas, and he ends up where they back out, and they they don't want to go to a level that someone else does. I it keeps us on our toes as fans. It drives you crazy as a journalist, but I think it's the way to operate where, you know, you catch other teams off guard. When you're catching the media off guard, in turn, you're catching the whole baseball industry off guard from time to time, and that's good. You're talking about, like, it's just hypothetical where you've traded, like, ten text messages, and then in the day, and then the Prince Fielder deal comes down, and it was never mentioned in any of those prior texts? Yeah, that sucks. You like, you like that. That really sucks. Like that. No, but it's good for Rangers fans, and, it's good, and I, I do – think so highly of that front office that they're like that. It's just so rare. So I'm like, where did that rumor come from? If the Rangers don't share those types of rumors and everybody's saying, oh, the Rangers arrived and they're shopping Elvis, how – and, and, and eventually you look at the, the payroll situation and they don't have an infinite amount of money. 
eventually, I mean, the whole deal about trading Kinsler is obviously opens up a spot for Profar, but I mean, there's a fourteen and a half million dollar difference there, and that you know what you're paying a guy to play that position. The same thing could eventually be said following this year when Elvis's big deal kicks in. By next year, will Odor, in your opinion, will he be ready to be an everyday player if the Rangers do decide to say, hey, look, Elvis, we love you, but we can't afford to pay you $15 million a year when we got a guy who'll do it for five hundred grand and we can use that money elsewhere. I mean, would it shock you to see them do that? No, I think there's a chance that if either one of those two goes down for three weeks and gets put on the DL, you know, not in April, but by July or August, if Odor has not had a hiccup at Frisco, he may be the guy that's up, not somebody from, from Round Rock. Um, and if nothing else, that may be a two- or three-week showcase. Um, you hear that other teams are already very much in on Odor, but I think he's going to get to the big leagues this year. Again, even if it's just for a, a quick stint while someone else is hurt. But by next year, I think, again, things have to keep coming together the way they have. But if they do, um, I, I, think, I think they view him as being ready next year. I mean, there's obviously some uh, guys who do a, a great job at following the minors, and a lot of them are here. Help me out because I'm more of just a caveman. What does Odor end up being in his prime? Where does he hit in the order? What are his numbers like? What type of player will he be? He's, he's probably like a two-hitter. He's not, he doesn't have blazing speed, but he's you know, the guy that I think you, he may be likened to in terms of his whole profile. And, again, he's probably not quite at this level, but he's a Pedroia type where he's sort of a badass that will get in your face. He will come up big in, in big moments. He's not going to be the fastest guy on the team. He's not going to have the most power on the team. He's not going to be the slickest fielder on the team. But he's one of those guys that when you look back at a game, you won by two runs, there are going to be three points in the game where you said Odor did something to help us win that game. I have heard that Profar described in that way as well. Pro, Profar is more, you know, probably more raw skill. You know, Profar has, you know, sick ability that can play at shortstop. Odor's not a shortstop. He's a second baseman. But he's, you know, Odor's that guy that's going to be filthy by the bottom of the first and will probably get into scraps at second base with a guy that comes in, spikes up. And I think the team's missing that kind of guy. Uh, all right, so uh, <laughs> Tepid P gives it the thumbs up. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated by that conundrum and how it goes. And, and, you know, obviously I get real excited about the next guy. Even if, I mean, you got, you and Ted were, were out at one of your events and you guys start telling me about you Darvish before the Ranger entered. I was like, Oh my God, they got to get you Darvish. And I'd never seen him. I never even heard anything about him until that conversation. I was like, they got to have him. Um, so, you know, I, one of those guys that's like that for me is a guy I've been waiting on to get here, and he's still just a young, young uh, dude, and that's Jorge Alfaro. I once asked somebody in the Rangers front office, this was two years ago, and they, they, they already had you, Darvish, and I said, all right, you can leave the Rangers front office right now. You can go to another team. You can take any three players with you. It can be a player right now at the major league level. It can be a prospect, whoever you want. And he said, no problem. It's, it's the easiest question you've ever asked me. One you Darvish, two jerks and Profar, three Jorge Alfaro. I'm like, wow, really? I was like, Jorge Alfaro, you know, I've heard rumblings. Why, if, if this kid reaches his potential, how good of a catcher will Jorge Alfaro be in the majors? Well, if he, if he reaches his absolute ceiling, he's a perennial all-star. And, you know, you're talking about, you know, pudge level ability. Now, that's not going to happen. I mean, that's... That's, that's a one in a hundred shot. But the fact that, it, that, that it's not one in a million, I mean, it speaks to the guy's ability. And I, I you know, that's an interesting question. I, I don't think you'll see any prospect lists this year, Baseball America, Baseball Prospectus, Tepid P, anybody who lists their top 20, 30 Rangers prospects, I don't think you'll see Alfaro number one on any of those lists. And if I were to do a list today, he wouldn't be number one for me, but he'd be the only guy in the entire system for me, including the big leagues, that's untouchable. Well, I would – Darvish, too. Um, but I wouldn't even say Adrian Beltre is untouchable. Um, but Jorge Alfaro, for me, you cannot have him. I don't care if it's a Stanton deal or a Price deal. I am so ready for this team to have a catcher that's here more than one year. And when he gets here, and if it does come close to all coming together, he's a guy that runs like an infielder. He throws like Pudge. He's an opposite field power hitter that can turn on a fastball down the line. 
He's hard-nosed. Um, from everything you read, he's made huge strides in calling a game and working with the staff and managing the game, which are things that the reasons the catchers take so long to arrive. That he made big strides in 2013 in those areas. And he's a guy that really can do everything you would want a catcher to do, and then some things you just never see catchers do. We got to have him. <laughs> oh, that, I agree. That, that scouting report was hashtag Alfaro approved, by the way. I love that. He'll, he'll put that now. If you follow him on Twitter, that movie was good. It was Alfaro approved. Uh, big fan of that. Um, all right, so do you think that because – the golden child is coming up through the ranks. That's why the Rangers didn't go all in on a guy like McCann, and that's why they've kind of put together this, you know, platoon, short-term type situation. I've gotten a lot of emails about the, the Aaron Sibia signing, especially after they locked up Soto. And I know some of the guys that shut down inning have written about how Aaron Sibia was a ridiculous addition. I think what it comes down to— Wait, wait, in a, ba- in a bad way? Yeah. They're, yeah. they're against it. Raise your hand. Who wrote that article? I think it was, is Peter here? It's somebody with short arms. You wrote it, right? (laughs) You're you're against the Aaron Sebia. Was it today? I don't, was it today? But you're against it, right? What I, what I think it is, is they didn't want to go to the level that it would take to sign McCann for two reasons. Number one, they think Alfaro will be here by the time McCann's deal is not even half through. And the other thing is they don't think McCann's going to be a catcher by the time his deal is about half through. And I just don't think there were a whole lot of options on the market where they saw a guy that was the right two- or three-year fit. And if that guy was out there at the right price point, they would have done it. But having not seeing that, they didn't want to spend $21 million in three years of Salty and guys like that. They figured take a flyer on Aaron Sebia. He's your backup guy. You know, he'll catch 60, 65 games. And there is that chance that he becomes Salty, starts to hit with a little power. He's not going to be the guy you're relying on to catch every day. And you can get rid of him in a year. You know, he's a club control guy. He's not in a locked-in contract. And so, you know, my sense is that he was sort of the best of what's left. I I don't think they saw a guy out there they wanted to commit to and end up blocking Alfaro. So right now, the way the Rangers are comprised, right now, no no other moves. They don't get you. In your opinion, can they win the AL West exactly as they're made up right now? They can, but I'm pretty damn sure they're not through. I, I don't. I don't think they're going into the season with Choice and Beltre or Choice and Aducey as their left field solution. I mean, could be worse. Uh, th- that combination could certainly do everything that David Murphy did last year and more. But I think they want better than that, and I think they're just being patient to let the market thin out a little bit more in terms of the teams that can either afford or need the right guy that's still out there. And it could be a trade. It may not be Chew or Cruz. It could be a trade. But I still think they're going to add a guy to, to, uh, to bat somewhere, you know, fifth to seventh and play left field. Give me three guys in the organization at any level who have the most legitimate shot at, at contending for an MVP, and it can't include Prince and can't include Beltre and no you Darvish. So you're saying in the minor league system? Or, or it, can be somebody, it could be somebody up, too. But I don't, I don't want any of the big, big, big money guys. And you, who's... Um, it's reasonable. Well, there, there, there's not an MVP in there. I mean, uh, you know, Alex Rios could have an all-star season. He's not an MVP type. Um, even in his best years, he was. I mean, he may have finished 15th in the MVP vote, something like that. And that would be great if you get that kind of season of a guy like that. Leonis could also have an all-star level season. Maybe not quite this year, but maybe. Maybe he's, he's almost there. Um, you know, in the minor league system, I'm not sure, you know, Profar is the guy that you could say eventually could be an MVP level talent. I think it would be shocking if he were top 10 for the next year, maybe two years. Stranger things have happened. I, I, I think right now this is a team offensively it, that's built around a lot of very solid players, but not there's not a Josh Hamilton in the group. There's not that guy that you look to unless Fielder gets back to what he was a couple years ago where you say – you know, this team's in contention strictly because of the way that guy's playing. All right, so in terms of, uh, if, of a guy taking a huge step forward, when you look at the major league roster, who are some of the candidates that we should be looking at 
where guys that aren't already there, but guys who have a chance to make the Rangers a heck of a lot better by making a major step in their career. Well, I mean, to me, that comes all down to, to Leonis and Jerickson. I mean, those, those are the two guys that are here. I guess you could throw Michael Choice into that mix, but I think that's a bit of a stretch. Um, if Choice comes in and actually commands the, you know, the greater half of a platoon, that's, to me, a success for this year. Uh, I don't expect too much more out of him. Maybe expect from him what you got out of Leonis last year, where he sort of you know, establishes himself. But this is the year I think they, they want to see Leonis take that next step and, and prove that he's a guy that could hit at the top of the lineup and be more than just a plus defender. Um, be a, a weapon on offense in the run game and, and, and do something at the plate. He's clearly got the ability. I mean, that's a guy that, you know, you could, you know, look in July and there's not anybody in baseball that's within five triples of him. You know, when he can combine the power he's got with his speed once he gets moving. Um, to me, that's the guy. Jerickson, I still think, is probably a year away of being the answer to that question. But uh, yeah, it, it, Profar is not a guy that I would bet against. So, if in terms of those two guys, you think it's more likely Profar has the uh, more of a breakout year, or is it because he has further to come, because he's coming from a kind of a lower spot? I, um, who, who, who has better numbers at the end of the year, Leonis or Profar? I will say Leonis. I will say Leonis because I, I think we saw, you know, those, uh, that six week f- flash last year where it was coming together, um, and I think Profar, it's you know, there's going to be a little bit of process for it to come together for him. Um, but again, I think it's a big deal that he's going to be playing in one spot every day defensively. And I think he's going to have a very solid year. But Leonis is the one that I expect to really take that next step. All right. So uh, this year for closer, are we looking at Neftali, Shepherds, Soria? What's, what's the thought? Yes. <laughs> I think All uh, of the, above. The, the reports are really good coming out of the Dominican on Feliz. Uh, not just that the velo is back, but he's starting to command the secondary stuff, which he really never did in the big leagues. And if he can actually show a second look that hitters have to respect, then that you know 96, 97 looks 101, and they can't just sit on it. And if he's that guy, then he's one of the ten best closers in the game, like that first year that he had the job. But you know, a lot with with Neff, a lot of it's mental and. And I'm just I'm happy to hear that he's having some success in winter ball and that he's starting to harness his stuff again. I think if that all comes back and has come together, he's he's the guy to beat. Um, Shepherds clearly has the stuff to close. He seems to have the sort of the the mental you know edge to do it. I really like him in the eighth. I mean the the idea of having him and Cots in the eighth, you know seventh and eighth. That's, you know, you can't do much better than that. So I'd, I would I'd kind of like to see Neffy win the job. Soria is one of those guys that, you know, when you look at a guy his first year back from Tommy John, it's all about refining the command, locating, and getting your stuff back. And then like Joe Nathan two years ago, that next year after Tommy John is when the stuff comes back. And so if Soria's stuff is back, obviously that's a guy that was an all-star closer a few years ago. So you got several options there, which is obviously great, that you don't have to hope on Feliz and you're in trouble otherwise. They've got options. Yeah, and uh, I, I was uh, doing a little digging on this, and about, I don't know, it was about, I don't know, two months ago maybe, uh, I was asking to uh, handicap, you know, the closer candidates. And what I was told was that Shepherds was the lead horse, and Ogando would be the second horse in that second most likely, followed by Soria and then Feliz. And I followed back up with that same person now after some, you know, winter ball's gone down and we've seen what these guys are doing, and I asked to re-handicap, and I was told Feliz is now, you know, the most likely to be the closer. And that, uh, you know, he has stepped up significantly and that, it, you know, he just has blown everybody away. It, groups, quit effing with everything. I, I almost <laughs> almost cussed. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, so Feliz has then jumped back into the mix, and I've always heard from players that, well, Feliz is a lazy guy. He doesn't want to run. And uh, being a guy who's never wanted to run myself, I always respected that. So I started <laughs> really started following his career more closely. I love this guy. Um, and so I know there was con- some concern about his – you're doing great work, Rubes. Amazing. It's amazing you're unemployed right now. That's really, really good, good stuff. <laughs> so uh, – so, uh, so uh, it's really fantastic work. It's really, really good. 
And so, uh, you know, he recently posted a picture of himself making Thanksgiving dinner or something with his shirt off. And it looked pretty good. And looked pretty good. The great Peter Elwood. Uh, so if you're going to call out what I wrote about today with the Rangers catching mistake, I want to just clarify. Uh, what I was trying to say there is that in a vacuum, I really like the Rangers catching solution for less than $5 million that they're paying for it. I think those two guys are going to be more valuable than that. The issue I have is that they're not right now using that savings to go elsewhere on the team and improve the offense in other ways. Because after 2013, they really needed to upgrade the offense. Clearly, it was lacking uh, throughout the season. And so far, they haven't done that yet. And uh, based on what JD said with you, Ben, last week, was that they're not going to make any more big, splashy moves. They're going to make incremental upgrades, find the right fits, improve their depth, and that sort of thing. If that's true, if they don't make any more big moves, then I think the offense is going to be a hole again in 2013. And catcher was an area that they could have upgraded along with left field and first base and DH. It's December 16th. <laughs> Number two, I bet if you look back at December 16th, 2011, I can't remember which year, 2010, J.D. probably went on Ben's show and said, I like our roster, I like our team. I think we're good. We're, we will always look for opportunities. And then they go sign Beltray and trade for Napoli in January. I don't believe JD one bit when he says we're done. I like that he says that, but I don't feel like because he says that, that this is, this is the, the roster he goes to camp with. It might be. It might be. But I promise you they are spending, and you know this. I'm not, I'm not trying to condescend. You know this, that every day, they're in their offices up at Ballpark Way, making calls, text, whiteboarding scenarios. They are working to see what they can do to improve, not catcher, because they've got two guys locked in now, but other parts of the roster. And like you said, spending less than $5 million on those two guys enables you to do something else with the roster without having to go to Bob and Ray and say, I need another big check. Yeah, and I also want to say, you know, over the years, gotten to know JD pretty well. Great dude. I don't trust a word he tells me. <laughs> it's like sitting across from that Asian dude who kicks ass at Texas Hold'em. <laughs> got those mirrored sunglasses on. He's like, I'm not going all in on another hand. Oh, you're not? Okay, good. I'm going to go all in then. Okay, good. I don't trust what he's saying, even on our own show. Can't, can't trust him. Fair enough. Good I, stuff. Just, yeah, Thank you. The great Peter Elwood. Good, good writer. Yes, sir. Step on up. Uh, I was just going to ask about uh, the rumor that Moreland, there's a lot of interest in Pittsburgh, and Michael Young being pretty much open outside of Los Angeles. Is there anything going on there? Is Moreland going to Pittsburgh for what? Jamie, there's nothing could, in Pittsburgh. That can I just intercept this? Uh, he's asking, is there interest in Mitch Moreland? And I'd just like to say a prayer. Uh, dear Lord... <laughs> Please let Jamie Newberg say yes, there is interest in Mitch Moreland. Okay, now, now you talk. My son. Uh, the next to last day of the winter meetings, I'm watching MLB Network in the morning. I'm writing, probably sending out a trot coffee, and I'm watching, and Peter is on live, and Peter Gammons. And they're sort of going and doing a little round table. And is this the day that Chu signs? Or is this the day that Matt Kemp gets traded? And all of a sudden, Gammon says, well, is Mitch Moreland for Justin Wilson sexy enough for you? And I think everybody at the desk stammered because they didn't know who Mitch Moreland or Justin Wilson were. <laughs> but, I, but obviously, I paused it. I wanted to make sure I heard it right. And I thought, I actually, actually... I actually sent Peter a text like, did you just? And I didn't hear back from him. And I know. I didn't hear back from him. Hold on a second. <laughs> several, just so you, several people in the back, in case you didn't know, some people in the front were denoted. Anyway. That was a humble so, brag. So I'm thinking, Justin Wilson, I've only seen him pitch a couple times, but I looked up some numbers to make sure I didn't just see him on a good day. But he's basically a left-handed Shepherds mm -hmm. who you can control for just as long. And if they can get that guy – throwing left-handed 95 out of the pen for Mitch Moreland. And, again, you know, I don't think Mitch Moreland's going to be Chris Davis, but I think they're probably gun-shy about trading a first baseman too soon, Adrian Gonzalez, 
Chris Davis. But if he doesn't have a role on the team and you really are going to play Prince defensively because he needs that and make Mitch your DH, that doesn't really seem to fit. Mm -hmm. And so if you could make that deal, I would love to see it. The second question about Michael Young possibly coming back, I just don't, I don't see the fit. And, and I assume that's what you were asking. Yeah, yeah, only because he's kind of a lost soul in Los Angeles right now. It looks, yeah. It seems and, that they're trying it, to dump him or whatever. When, when, I, when I say I don't think he's a fit here, it's not because I think the Dodgers or Angels are about to sign him. I just don't think he really fits the mix here mm -hmm. because of what you need and because of how things ended and it wasn't so clean and I – I'm not sure how much interest there would be on either side in making that happen. And I could be co totally wrong about that, but I think, I think what they're looking for right now uh, to round out the roster, especially with the role players, aside from a big bat and left, mm -hmm. would not be the kind of player that Michael Young is at this point in his career. Well, who we're looking at is utility infielder then. Or he asked about utility infielder. Right now it's, you know, Adam Rosales. Okay. And, and I don't – I don't necessarily think that they're done there. Um, they signed Brent Lillibridge a week ago to a minor league deal. Wouldn't surprise me if they bring in another guy like that just to compete. Josh Wilson came in on a non-roster deal. I mean. So you've got guys, right. Yeah. But there's not that guy that they have brought in yet that you can say, okay, right there is the utility infielder. We can stop looking. Um, you know, maybe they've been on some guys that ended up sign, you know, signing elsewhere and they'll keep looking. Um, I don't think they're going to uh, – I don't think they would give that job to Odor or Luis Sardinas because they want them playing every day. So we may not have the guy yet who's going to be the utility infielder, but it could be Rosales. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. Come on up. Anybody get in line if you have a question? The Peter Gammons thing, I, I love that. I love that Peter Gammons loves you. I love that he retweets you. I love that he includes your stuff. I think it's fantastic because he's, you know, he's a godfather of, of baseball writers. And I can tell you guys from, uh, you know, when we were at ESPN, we sat down with our program director and they said, and, they, you know, the program director's kind of sticking his chest out, knowing that they have all these baseball writers and this access to all these people. And he said, you're at ESPN now. You can have any baseball writer on the show. Who do you want? Big proud smile. And Skin and I at the same time go, Jamie Newberg. <laughs> he goes, the lawyer? We're like, yeah. <laughs> well, but we've got this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. No, we want Newberg. And uh, that's to your credit, man. You do uh, See, look how uncomfortable he is. Um. I'm going to ask you gentlemen to go in your baseball time machine. A lot of talk at the trade deadline about the Rangers being interested in Robinson Cano. If that discussion took place, who would the Rangers have been willing to trade for him versus who were the Yankees asking for him? Back in July? Yes. When he was a pending free agent. Exactly. So you'd be trading for two months of Cano. Pretty much. That's that's what I've been stuck up on. Because I would, obviously you're looking at Kinsler, but then... I would guess that what the Yankees wanted was Derek Holland and a couple prospects. You know, they'd want a guy that they knew would fit in their rotation, not at the back end, but, you know, somewhere two, three, four. Um, you know, they'd probably say, well, you know, we'd take Holland and Odor, something like that. Something that Texas just wouldn't do. Um now, if Cano had a year and a half of control or two and a half years of control and not just those two months, maybe. You know, maybe that fits because you decide, you know, you know, let's say Colby Lewis had come back healthy and you felt like you had an extra starter and you could get Cano for the stretch and you had him coming back like Rios, maybe. But for a rental hitter, um, I would expect that the Yankees were not going to trade a guy that was that central to their core without getting just a huge impact return. I mean, frankly, I'm shocked that they didn't sign him this winter. But with the way Seattle A-rotted them out of the water and basically had no competition, it was very much like when Texas signed Alex. You know, Atlanta was $60 million off. Sim similar deal. Cano pretty much couldn't turn it down. I guarantee you he didn't want to go to Seattle over New York. But he couldn't turn down all that extra cash, and Jay-Z wasn't going to let him. And... <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's good for his business that he's just established this new level for a, you know, a position player pro, uh, free agent. But the Yankees have gone on and spent like a drunken sailor. So why would they not want to bring Robinson Cano back? That's my question, and I will stare awkwardly and turn away and leave. I have the same question. I, I, don't, I don't know why. You know, for them to actually exercise a little bit of financial restraint is a new thing. Um, 
I respect them for it. Uh, it you know, it, it weakens them, strengthens Seattle. Uh, I'm, I'm very surprised it happened. Um, I was asking somebody with knowledge of the Rangers thinking during the Robinson Cano sweepstakes, and I, I was like, come on, man, just tell me. You know, I want to know, are you guys interested in Cano? Do you think it's going to happen? And I was getting, you know, obviously, who wouldn't be interested? But I think that the numbers are going to be so high that I think it's going to be hard for us to participate. And I'm like, okay, that's what I thought. And he goes, but don't say anything because some of the guys really want to meet Beyonce and Jay-Z. <laughs> Classic. Yes, sir.